We'll just start our last separated talk for today, because um, after this we have an end note, which is good. So here we have um, Grant Patton Simpson has been whispering all day to save his voice for this presentation, and I'd like to introduce him to do his great talk. Here we go. Thank you. Okay. Is, is James Mitchell here at the moment? That's good. He said he's, he is. Can someone large sit next to him and if he laughs? <laughs> okay. All right. I'm really actually quite excited about this topic. It's about coding over the long term. Can you hear me clearly? I'll try to keep calm so I keep my voice to the end. <laughs> okay. It's about longer term development projects, but a lot of what I'm talking about applies to smaller projects as well. Okay, I'm starting with SOFA statistics as the example, and it produces charts, tables, uh, statistical analyses, and it's written in Python, as you'd expect. Oops, sorry, I'll just go back to that. And it runs cross-platform. The open source core is released under the AGPL3, that's the bulk of it, and there are now two proprietary plugins, uh, which I'm trying out. Oops, Daisy, I'll just move back to this. Yeah. Okay, so there's just an example. There's a wide range of quite configurable charts there and chart series. I try and keep it simple, but there's a lot of power in it. That's an example of the statistics wizard and uh, helping people make sensible choices, more or less, about, um, about a group of uh, eight main tests, and it provides a whole lot of output and help and examples as you go. Because learn as you go is one of the um, main goals. Can people still hear me? Okay, and the other major part of the project is uh, report tables, and it's, it's all HTML, I'll talk about that more later, but it basically enables you to do a wide range of tables in the same interface and style them by just clicking on buttons and things. Okay, the output is HTML, so it, you can, it's web ready. And the two, one of the proprietary plugins enables uh, the production of PDFs and PNGs. And uh, that was, that was uh, far from trivial, believe it or not, even though there are tools like WK HTML to PDF. There's actually a lot of nuts and bolts to get actually what you're trying out of the raw HTML, which it does, except in Mac. <laughs> I'll come back to cross-platform later. I use the Dojo JavaScript uh, SVG toolkit for charts. Uh, one reason was to get dynamic effects, so you hover over things and, and they move and it's all very pretty. Um, Glenn, is he here? I can't remember. I think uh, complained about, yes, I, I never forget when he saw a histogram doing things that a histogram has no right to be doing, um, looking pretty and showing off and glossy effects. But um, it's, one of the, it's the, one of the other goals of SOFA is to be beautiful output. It uses matplotlib and boom slang, which is a wrapper uh, for things like clustered um, bar charts, for the auxiliary charts. So they are sort of charts in support of an analysis rather than telling the main story of the um, analysis itself. I've used WXPython for, as the cross-platform GUI toolkit. And as you can see, it uses native widgets for each platform. Sometimes, often, I love the ease of just being able to build something and it just works on every platform. But sometimes you hit these tiny little differences and what is easy in one might take, say, five minutes and in another three days to work around some bug. And it's, I'll come back to that later too. As I said, for exporting the output, um, there's a number of different libraries, um, all of which play their own particular part in getting the appropriate image out, cropped, and the right size, even if people do something across multiple pages, how do you handle that? It handles that sort of stuff as well as possible. Okay, um, it's now past the 100,000 download mark, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, you can't see exactly on the left there, but you get the basic idea. Just recently, I um, just got an email from some people saying that they were big fans of it at the Max Planck Institute which I was uh, very, very um, pleased with. Um, but you're, there's plenty of people using it um, who can't afford proprietary software, um, aid workers in Malawi, um, 
a gastroenterologist in northern India. Um, they have no budget for software. So it's interesting what happens there. Okay, now getting a bit more focused about, you know, on, on topic about coding in the longer term. SOFA is a long-term project. It's, it's already been running for over three years. Um, approximately 900 commits, 50 releases, and it's about 30,000 lines of code. Um, so what have I learned from that? One of the things is that the DNA of a project can get ver uh, set very early. Um, not the implementation, but the basic how you go about doing things. So you really want to sort of think it through a bit at the beginning. I'm actually, it turns out that the DNA of, of this I'm actually quite pleased with. Um, it's, it stood up quite well. What basically happens is there's sofa in the middle, as you can see. And on the left, what it does is you don't, some um, stats packages, you have to import everything in. It has to become part of that data, and that's it. If you want to get fresh data, you have to run some sort of script or syntax to update it. It depends on your package. That's not the case with Sofa. It's just dynamic. It uses SQL. It just connects. And it links to you know, MySQL, PostgreSQL. You can see them there. And uh, there's a new one just joining the group, uh, Kubrid, which uh, I hadn't heard of before. And if you do import data into uh, SOFA, uh, down the bottom left there you'll see, what it actually is doing is importing it into SQLite. And then thereafter you're just linking to it as one of the SQL databases. That's right, that's good. And uh, so what happens then, this is part of the basic how it does stuff, is it takes input from the GUI where you actually set things up and it, it sort of creates a script, a Python script. So that's a text file. Okay. Once it has that script, which incidentally you can grab from the internal folder where it's sitting and run it manually, you, it actually generates the HTML, which is basically another text file with all the JavaScript in it and so on. It also might generate some matplotlib charts. And then the, the GUI actually then displays that uh, within the, its own interface. And it has to do a whole lot of um, fancy stuff because the CSS might not be in the same place and it might be, um, it need to be explicitly linked and all sorts of stuff. But that's the basic way it works. And one of the benefits of the architecture is that you can, um, uh, you can add new plugins quite easily uh, for databases and you can run the whole thing headless. So you don't actually have to use the GUI at all and I sort of see some potential for that down the track. Okay. Now, some people say good practice matters always. Well, that's not true. Not for a quick little script, something horrible where you use, you know, an idle. When I'm testing, I call things A and B and C in my variables, and it's only a few lines of testing. It's, it's not true. But when you're doing anything that gets a bit larger, it starts to matter more and more and more. So there's a time for hacking, and there's a time for refactoring. Um, I like the example in the talk on Django, uh, Django Evil. Um, about the way that a project with, had sort of grown and grown and grown. Now, one thing we should probably note is that that was a project where they had money to pay for someone to do further work. So in a business sense, somehow, it might have been doing something right. In a coding sense, there were some quite horrible things going on and, in fact, uh, being perpetuated. But it was... Um, anyway, so the issue is sometimes there's a time for refactoring. I like this one here. That's what it can be like. You know, you start off, you've got this lovely logical code which suits the thing that you're doing with your code, and, um, you know, you just add a bit here to just this case. Add a bit there. You can just, you're just hanging in there. You add little comments as well for these extra sort of things like, this is always true, oh, except when. And it goes on and on until eventually it's time, it really is time to start thinking about refactoring. Okay, there's several reasons for refactoring. Well, one of them on the far right you can see there is to avoid ending up in coding horror. Um, I think that's a perfectly valid reason. Um, but more uh, obvious reasons might be to reduce bugs, make it easier to add features. And I think that for many of us here, there's an element of craftsmanship here where we, we may not always be able to do it in every job for economic reasons or time reasons or whatever, but we would prefer to do it properly if we can. Um, Martin Fowler, who's written quite a lot on refactoring, he talks about some of the um, code smells. I really liked the idea of, what was it, design smells. 
that was, that was awesome. I thought that was, um, I'd love to hear a talk on design smells sometime. But in code smells, things like duplicated code, you've repeated yourself. I say that lo you know, long methods, big classes, are things to just watch out for. But for me, the biggest sign that there's something horribly wrong with your code and you need to refactor it is fear. How do you feel when you look over your code, your code base? And you look at that bit and you go, oh, that, oh that's happy. I like to work on that bit. I like that bit. Oh, here there be dragons. You know, you feel a sort of thing, oh, I don't want to touch that. I know that if I touch that, it's going to be bad. <laughs> okay, so if you're afraid to change something, that's a really, really good clue that there's something that's poorly designed. Okay? And an actual example from the SOFA project was the, the charting facility started off so uh, innocently, it just had one drop down, I think. It just was a bar chart and you just chose your variable. Okay, and it was uh, what it was charting by. And then later on I added chart series, so I was charting this variable by something else, and I added scatter plots, so sometimes that was X and Y. And then, anyway, the story is, before you know it, you've got up to four different um, drop downs. You, it varies depending on whether you're choosing the average of a variable as well or not. Um, et cetera, et cetera, and the very labels change, even the width of the drop downs changes. So I was getting very, very freaked out about making any new additions to this area, and I thought, look, that's it, that's stupid. And I refactored the living daylights out of it. <laughs> I just went crazy. I just, I fixed it up good and proper. Um, and then when I had to add new ones, which I did, I was just, I was just so relaxing. <laughs> So uh, I can strongly recommend that. So when to refactor, I think the simple answer is refactor when it costs more not to. So if it's not costing you anything, it's really, you know, do it if you have the time or you feel like it or as a hobby. But if it's costing you, then you really need to think about it. So Martin Fowler again. If you keep changing the system, if you're going to be adding to it new features, you know, bugs and all sorts of things, then it's probably going to start paying back. And in a longer term project where you've got more of a commitment to it, it becomes much, much more likely that any refactoring you do is going to be cost effective in your own time and effort um, because of the, the long term nature of the project. Okay, another lesson, tidy is good. Um, I was gonna make a comment about the domestic sphere and I've decided not to, because I'm on record. Tidiness is a virtue. Um, well, that's one reason. There's little Miss Tidy, and you know, when we tidy up our code, I know I've, I've seen people who have you know, spent a long amount of time removing those extra spaces at the ends of lines. And let's put up your hands if you've ever done that. It's actually a good idea sometimes because you're actually what you're actually doing is you're relaxing your mind while you're thinking about something else. That's the real reason. But there is a little bit of a tidiness thing there, and uh, it can be a virtue. So you can find things. So I know, for example, that if I'm, there's, there's elements of the GUI interface of multiple parts of SOFA which are all the same. And I know where they're based. They're in the uh, config output module and they're in the, probably the, the um, config UI class. And it's all really quite clean. And it's very relaxing. So being tidy is good like that. You can find stuff. But it is a means to an end. You're never going to achieve perfection and uh, you, there is a real risk of ending up being little Mr. Fussy, right? Because to some extent, coding, you can have test-driven development, I think that's true, that's, that's got a lot to it as, a, as an, um, an idea, but you also need creativity-driven development too, where you're sort of hacking around and doing wild, crazy things quickly, especially in Python, and you want to figure out a way of not stifling that or killing that off. So. Like all good things, tidiness has to be uh, taken in moderation. Yeah. That, that, by the way, is a picture of someone gorgeous's uh, guts um, making the point that users don't care what's underneath. Right? We don't, they don't care. Um, and we, the whole quote is worth having, so it'll be, I presume, in the slides of this presentation. But the main bit for me was too much of a particular kind of thinking can turn you into an obsessive architect of abstract code, not the builder of things people want. And I think that message that we want to be the builder of people of <laughs> builder of things people want um, is really essential. I think that came through in, in uh, the 
the keynote this morning as well. Some things to think about. But anyway, back to the virtues of tidiness uh, and modularity anyway, is it makes it easier to share your code. Like uh, recently, oh by the way, I was looking for these images at about 5.30, 5.40. Dinner was looking like it was going to be around 7. And I found it really, really difficult doing a Google search on pages and pages of chocolate. Um, <laughs> it, it really was hard. And when I looked back at it after dinner, it just didn't have any appeal. Anyway. But uh, the idea there is that when you've got your code in a reasonably modular form, if you want to add, say, a Kubrid module database engine, the guy, I said to the guy who was from Romania, I said, um, here's the MySQL one. Um, start modifying that until it starts working, and I'll help. And, um, and that's what we did. And it's very, very similar to the other five SQL-type modules, but it has its differences. The, way it, the implementations are different. And it was basically really relaxing. He didn't really have to understand much. I made a couple of broad changes around, uh, I think their database, they, own, they don't have inner join. They just have comma. So I, had, I just added that to each um, database engine from now on, so it was abstracted. But apart from that, it was just modifying the one file, and that was really good. Okay, the issue of when to build it yourself, you know, when to go through that effort. You know, sometimes, sometimes you know, people say you shouldn't reinvent the wheel, and there's a lot of uh, virtue in that. Here's an example, by the way, if you look closely, of a reinvented wheel, and I, I actually think that's really awesome. There's no spoke, there's no axle. Okay. That's got to be cool. So there may be a place, <laughs> there may be a place, it would be worth riding one of those around actually, something swinging around in the middle to make it clear there was no axle, I don't know. Um, there may be a place for reinventing the wheel, but like for example, I might mention this later, I, I, with Dojo, there's no way I wanted to go near in, IE, you know, Internet Exploder compatibility issues. I didn't want to go near them. So I'd rather that they solve those problems and I have modified them. Um, so sometimes you just don't want to go near it. It's too complex. Because after all, laziness is a virtue when it comes to being a programmer. Laziness, hopefully, in a clever way. Um, you're trying to avoid unnecessary work. And sometimes there's more to code than you realize. But basically, this is now referring back to SOFA statistics, you don't always have a choice as to what level of effort you put in. Now, on the left-hand side, it's the, the least work, least control end. That's where you just plop a library in and you just use it. The other end, you get the most work, but you also get the most control. So, for example, when Kubrid wanted to join in to SOFA, um, I was able to make some quite big changes on the spot, and Kubrid works. Whereas if I'd been relying on certain libraries with certain dependencies and so on, it could have turned into quite a challenge. It depends. Statlib. Um, people here use um, SciPy? A few people? Yeah, the Statlib part of that. Anyone use the Statlib part? No. Okay. Well, I just took that, gutted all the bits and pieces I didn't need, shrunk the whole thing down to a fraction of its size, and I used that instead. And I just very, very carefully document even the slightest changes I make to anything because with stats, small variations and tiny floating point numbers and things like that can diverge into catastrophically different results. So you have to be very careful, have lots of good testing. With, e with um, Excel spreadsheets, it was originally, um, most of it was my own code, um, but I came across XLRD, XLRD, yep, for read, and uh, now it's basically a thin wrapper and it was cross-platform to boot, so that was good. Dojo, that's a massive library. Anyone here use the Dojo toolkit themselves? Yeah, it's a lot in it. It's quite large. Um, it's a lot of tricky JavaScript. If JavaScript's not your primary language or one of them, there's quite a bit in it. But I was determined to get various features and functionality to work, like putting the SOFA statistics down the side of graphs in exactly the right place, which was really hard. Um, box plots, there was no engine for that, really, apart from one demo script. So you have to do it. I had to do a lot myself. But I still wasn't going to rewrite Dojo. So that's in between. CSV, some of you will be wondering, you'll think, wait a second, there's a CSV module. Why doesn't he go import CSV and just a couple of little lines and he'll be done? <clears throat> the problem is that there's lots of encoding issues and there's lots of things where I'm wanting to display to users 
this is what your CSV looks like with this encoding, this encoding, this encoding. You can drop down and choose until it's right. And there were lots of things there. And I didn't want to use the LibreOffice functionality and create a whole ton of dependencies in my packaging, massive dependencies. So there may be a better way, and I might shift it to the left later, but at the moment that was the solution. And finally, um, spreadsheets for, um, in the open document format, there was a lot of bespoke code, uh, a lot of XML handling, a lot of odd things that people do in the way the XML is structured. Numeric is slightly different from what's generated by LibreOffice Calc, but um, you handle all of that. And basically, it's good to have control, because if something fails for your users, then they don't, they're not really interested in what's underneath or what your excuse is, not really. You want to fix it, and you get that control. Oops, I knew I was going to do that one day. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another obvious point, but it becomes more important. We're writing for humans. Now, these are made-up charts, as you can probably work out. Like, how would you quantify that? But on a longer-term project, a higher percentage of time is spent reading existing code rather than writing fresh code. So when you're hacking out a quick script, maybe 60 lines, 30 lines, you're sort of thinking onto the page. And then you make a few corrections when you've stuffed up a couple of syntax things. And then you run it, and you might just keep running it if it keeps working. But in a longer term project, you spend more and more time reading carefully what you've done before so that when you make your changes, you don't have um, unintended consequences. Uh, who was it was mentioning leaky abstraction? Yeah. That was, that, were you thinking of the Joel Spolsky article? Um, there's a bunch. There's a bunch, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So readability counts. So I like these quotes here. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. And programs must be... My wife hated this one, but anyway, she said it didn't really make sense. But programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And I think in the Python community, we're quite keen on the idea of readability. It's sort of built into the language... Uh, from its very origins. Uh, it wasn't ABC, which was the predecessor, uh, meant to be a learning language, an educational one? I think so. Anyway, it's in the zen of Python. Readability counts. And to, to describe something as clever, or, you know, uh, I think of it as not clever. We like clever. Tricky clever, wicked clever. You know, like, oh, it's recursive, and it goes back onto itself and uses the width of the letters to calculate this, and, and I can get it down to this. That's not a virtue. That's a, that's a nightmare. Okay, clear meaning means more obvious bugs. So there we have a really obvious example at the top left. You know, who's, who's ever faffed about at the back of the cabinet, which is usually horrible um, in the dark, because you don't remember during the day, during daylight. So it's night time and the d light's no good. And you're faffing about plugging things in, trying to get DVD players and other equipment all working, and the kids have unplugged something to put an Xbox in, and now you can't even tape Shortland Street for the wife or anything. Anyone sort of... Been, been there at the back of the TV or... Colour coding is wonderful. Colour coding is wonderful. It's, sometimes you spot obvious mistakes, and that's what you want. You want your code... Um, I can't remember the quote. It was something like... Um, you don't want it to be that there's nothing obviously wrong. You want it to be obvious that there's nothing wrong. It's what you want. So, for example, if your code says me, open bracket one, so the second item will return us what? You have no idea what to expect. It's not obvious. You're going to have to read the code to work it out. It's quite a load. But if it said me.surname, you'd know what it's really doing. And if you saw a line and it said, if me.surname equals equals Sarah, you'd go, hmm, that's a bit fishy. I wonder if um, you know, something's wrong, and, and you're onto it. Um, uh -huh, right keyboard. <laughs> Another thing with a long-term project is you, when you approach code, there is a temptation to just go in, understand it, make your change, you pass your tests, you've got the new feature, walk away, <laughs> right? But um, your later self, which has been mentioned in another talk, is going to hate you. There's probably things that didn't make sense and you had to get back into your head before you understood what was going on. Perhaps those should be documented. Just little clues, you know, like... The reason you don't have to worry about this is because of blah, or the reason why you have to do this extraneous step is because otherwise it fails on max, right? Things like that. 
those little, little reasons that later on are not obvious. Some people say when you need to write a comment, just check that you don't need to refactor your code to make the comment superfluous, and there's a lot of wisdom in that. But comments, uh, good comments anyway, are, fri are your friend. Okay. This, this is sort of... I have a very good friend who sometimes acts a bit infallible <laughs> um, with code and things like that. And I think we need to understand that we are fallible. We are humans. We are not always coding in our peak times. You know how people feel tired in the afternoon sometimes and start yawning and so on? What if you have to code during that and you're coding a particularly hard bit? Right? It happens. So what did I mean by Y1 and Y0? So always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live. Code for readability. I'd say code for survival. And sometimes that violent psychopath might be yourself later on. Okay, this one. Someone has to take out the trash. Um, and a longer term, or we're not, are sort of sometimes interchangeable longer term projects and larger projects, but they often go together because projects grow as they get older sometimes. You can't just throw your code over the fence. <laughs> well, you can. And for a, but it might not be destined to become a longer term project. I know there's someone going to be talking about um, documentation or you know, won't grow a community unless you... Um, anyway, that, that relates to that. So there are, there's always a number of important but less desirable jobs. I mentioned fixing cross-platform discrepancies. Now, uh, how many people have done you know, web development? Yeah. How many people, keep your hands up if you've done web development. How many people, keep your hands up if you've sometimes ever wanted to destroy Internet Explorer? <laughs> really hurt it, you know? Really give it some pain. Yeah, yeah. It's like that with cross-platform as well when you're doing desktop apps. Um, uh, I'll give you one example. And I hope, well, I don't know, I'm of a mixed mind. The refactoring I did to make things work was pretty cool, so I don't mind necessarily if there's a simple way around this. But with drop-downs, I wanted to shrink the font so I could fit more chart options in the space available. On two of the three operating systems, that was quite trivial. One of them, it was one line of code, and it just deployed it over the whole frame. Another one, you just apply it to each object that you wanted to change. But for the third operating system, what happened was it became massively non-performant. That was that if you dynamically recreated the contents of the drop-down by changing database, it was as if it was changing the font for each item. Now, if there were four items, that didn't no you didn't notice. But if it was 192, for some reason they had 192 tables in their demo database, you took four seconds waiting for the drop-down to size and shape. You found out, right? You hate that operating system. Sorry? In that case, my favorite operating system was Linux. <laughs> they, well, one thing I should say is they each take their turn as being my most hated operating system. Um, depending on which cross-platform discrepancy I have to handle. But that happens. And that, that, I'd call that like the trash. There you are. You've spent a, a short time making this new plugin. It's written. It works. Now to make it cross-platform. And, and you go through that grief. Translation. The release process. I've had over 50 releases. There's a certain mechanics that you try and do. Testing. Community liaison when there's a problem. Documentation. And packaging. Um, sometimes you, you go through a lot of grief with... Um, Mac's been one of the hardest in some ways for that, but I've gotten some, most of that sorted. So there are lots of hats to wear. I'll give you a clue. One of them... I'd say probably the hard hat belongs to probably help desk. Just give you a moment to think about them. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I originally had some hats that didn't actually match the words, and I thought that was a bit mean. But I'd probably, I don't know, the statistician has to be a bit of a wizard. I'm not sure about the designer. Who thinks design is F? Yeah, who's, <laughs> who, who's the cowboy? Designer. Designer. <laughs> um, the architect could be an explorer. I don't know. You've got lots of different hats to wear on any sort of longer term project. And you're not going to be equally good at all of them. Um, 
And even if you have a team of people, you're not necessarily going to be evenly um, good at all those parts. So this is the final slide. There's a certain element of making trade-offs. Um, you know, the, the, the quote at the top is about, I think, trade-offs in code itself, internal to code. So the idea there is that it's still about making perfect code. You know, you might trade off um, readability versus straight out performance or something like that. But it's actually trade-offs across all the things that make a project about building stuff that people want to use and making it so that they can use it. So there's an optimization problem. You're juggling lots of different things, thus the image on the left. So being a perfect coder may be at the expense of effective marketing. Or it may be that, um, the reason I pick on that is because this is a, more of a coding conference. So when we try and set the balance of how we do our projects with the constraints that we have to face, we need to listen to the advice of people who actually get things done. So um, some people give advice which is sort of like, you know, it's all, it's all very sort of perfect. It's from an ethereal realm where there's never deadlines, there's never shortages of resources, there's never... Um, stuff like that. Yeah, there's no users. Yeah, that's right. That stops all the bugs because you never hear about them. Okay, well, that's the... Um, I think we're uh, done. Is that about right? Yeah. We'll probably have a few moments for a couple of questions. If you're still good to talk. Okay. Do we have any quick questions? It is a question, not stretching. No, no, it's a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, if I understood it correctly, your presentation layer is at least partly partly HTML. Is that correct, or the, the expression layer? Yes. Yeah, HTML with JavaScript, and it right. might have some linked images. The Matplotlib, uh, Matplotlib auxiliary images are all linked images. They're actually made. Right, but but it's within a client that you install on. It's not a brow you're not using a browser to display that HTML. Uh, well, that's a trick question. <laughs> Internally, you are using um, within WX Python um, a GUI right. renderer, right? Which is um, the browser engine, the IE yeah. renderer on Windows, because then there's no extra packaging. Yeah. Uh, Web, Web, uh, WX uh, WebKit right. on the other two. So my question was, <laughs> uh, you spoke about early DNA. You know, early the DNA gets set and all the rest of it. Today, would you do what you did, or would you just make it purely a browser? People have asked me that. I think I've, I came across a French guy who was trying to do a Man Whitney U on 17 million records. <laughs> and Man Whitney U, uh, if I remember correctly, if I've got the right one, was is, is some sort of, I don't know what the algorithm is, I'll have another look, but it's some sort of ranking business, right? I didn't do a proper estimate, but I thought it might complete sometime <laughs> after the, you know, the ice caps have melted. <laughs> and that's whether or not you think global warming's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so you've got large volumes of data that you need ready access. Yeah, and there's also some, a lot of it's sensitive. Um, people are using, uh, I'm amazed at what people use so for four, you know, like um, gene testing stuff and <laughs> just all sorts of things. They do. They, I mean, sometimes when there's a bug, I ask people to send me something, and usually they can, but often they have to clean it first. Um, and if it's you know encoding issues, because it's very international. Yeah, I also had the right to left issue as well with the GUI, which I, I'm not sure if I completely solved. I think I did, for Hebrew and Persian and various others. No other questions. Okay, thanks, Grant, very much.